Hey everybody, this is Eric Lopez, also known as Blue Beetle and the Scarab. And you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-0-1. Recognized, Knight Errant, D-4-6. Hello team. Today in the Watchtower, we're joined by Jared Rasher. When not working as a data analyst, Jared has been a moderator on a number of online gaming websites, as well as writing reviews for the multi-Any Award winning website Gnome Stew. Reviews that he admittedly uses to justify all the games that he can't stop himself from buying. (laughs) I feel you, buddy. (laughs) Of course, Jared is also a huge Young Justice fan. Jared, thanks so much for joining us in the Watchtower. Thank you for having me. I have loved this show for quite a while now. I am very honored to be here. (laughs) We appreciate that. You got me all flustered. Uh, Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice up to and including episode 13 of season three the comics, and the video game. If you've not seen, read, or played all of the material and are spoiler-wary, please consider this your warning. Uh, and with all the out of the way, let's dive in. So I touched on a couple things in the intro, Jared, but you do some other things too. You Don't you appear on Gnome Stew's podcasts periodically as well? Yeah, I've been on a few of the uh, Gnomecast episodes. Uh, sometimes it's talking about things that dovetail with articles that we've written, so we'll pull in some gnomes that have some opinions on those uh, articles that one or the other of us have written. So I've been on there a few times. So you've done reviews, but do you write other articles for the site as well? Yeah, every once in a while. Um, My primary thing that I do is the uh, reviews, but I've done a few opinion pieces. I did kind of a report from uh, Gary Khan last year. And uh, last Friday, I had a one of... (sighs) It's not really one of my favorite things to have written, but it was something I was very passionate when I was talking about some of the controversy that was going on in the gaming industry and the responsibility of people that have privilege towards making things more inclusive for people. You're talking about the recent stuff we've been going through in our industry, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, because we don't want to leave people out, we've had, uh, we basically had our own kind of bit of Harvey Weinstein uh, situations going on in our gaming industry that's, that's caused some... Uh, reflection and uh, choices to be made by some people and uh, names in the industry being able to to make some statements, strong statements uh, in support of um, people who have gone through abuse and issues and problems. And uh, so we've been we've been it's it's been pretty heavy in, in our industry for the last several weeks. Um, <laughs> So uh, I have not read your opinion piece on the subject. Uh, I wrote a small dissertation on my Twitter feed myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, we'll we'll, uh, we'll aim people in that direction if you want to find out more. Uh, but uh, so so you so you've had done more than that. And when you're when you're on the podcast, the it, you're talking about misdirected Mark or Gnome Stew's specific podcast. Um, it's part of the misdirected Mark, uh, network, but it is specifically the, uh, podcast for those of us that are on the, uh, the Gnome Stew website, writing articles and things like that. So Mm -hmm. every once in a while, a handful of us will get together and we'll just talk for a while. So most recently I was just on last week talking about initiative and handling a different player order and things like that. And we've had other gnomes on this on the show as well. Angela Murray has been on the show talking about the use of drama and comedy, uh, which was fantastic. We had Chris Nizak uh, on the show as well talking about the history of the Green Lantern Corps. We're uh, we're fans of the fans of the gnomes, <laughs> uh, so I'm glad that you can come on and join us. So, building on uh, kind of all that, what's your origin story? How did you get involved in gaming in the RPG community? And tying into that, like, what's your history with comics before Young Justice as well? I think everything, everything geeky that I have is due to the fact that I had older siblings. My, I heard a rumor that you stole your older sister's D and D. Yes, I did. Box set. Okay. Yes, I did. Right. Um, Starts she, with a felony. This story. <laughs> well, it was just sitting there, and she had like a misdemeanor used it for like a year, <laughs> and it was lonely, and it needed somebody to read through it and use it. <laughs> But yeah, she got it for her uh, birthday one year, and she kind of dove through it a little bit, but never really did anything with it. So eventually, I liberated it from her room. And and had you heard had you heard of it before, or heard of role playing games before? Like, what? How old were you? What year was this? Oh, this was 
nineteen eighty five because I'm oh, ancient. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel you. I'm feeling you. But I mean, everything everything geeky that I have, I can trace back to one of my older siblings. Like uh, the comic books that I start, I first read were things that I um, I got as hand me downs from my brother. So I got like old Spider Man and Batman comics, and I got one of the old. You know, they would they would reprint these anthologies of like not in any chronological order, just a bunch of different stories um, back in the 70s. And I had one of those for Legion of Superheroes and Batman. And yes, Legion. And, oh, yeah. So <laughs> these were some of the first, you know, things that I actually literally learned to read. Uh, and around that time, um, probably about the time I, everything that I've been looking at recently when I was trying to find the earliest comics that I picked out that I didn't just read of my brothers are all. Kind of around 1980, 81. Those are kind of like the earliest ones where I went to a grocery store and said, I want that one. The old spin rack? Grocery oh, yeah. store spin rack? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, there, there were grocery stores that I would beg my mom to go shopping at because they had better comic selection. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Flashbacks. Flashbacks. <laughs> I think I talked on the show about when I'd, I'd be home from school sick or something, my mom would go and get me some comics, but I think she went to the same place every time and they never restocked. So I had like three copies of the same <laughs> Spider-Man issue. Well, yeah, yeah, that was the thing back then. We were forced to have more eclectic taste because right. if you didn't, right. if they didn't reorder the same thing for several right. months in a row, you never got the end of a story. If it was <laughs> right. a multi-part you're, story. And you're inevitably at the middle of the story, right? <laughs> What's happening right now? It's total chaos. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For but, sure, for sure. But yeah, and then on top of that, um, I had one sister that was big into Tolkien. I had another sister that was big into uh, C.S. Lewis. So between the two of them, I got into fantasy. <laughs> did they just have boxing matches or like? <laughs> <laughs> well, they did, but not over that. I mean, <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> but yeah, that's essentially, fair. it was just I had older. And of course, the I know we're talking about DC and I dearly love DC. But the crown jewel of all of my geekiness was from my older sister coming home one night and saying, we have to go take the family to go see Star Wars because this uh, is something everyone yeah. needs to go see. And, you know, that. Yes. <laughs> I was there. My dad did that for me. Seventh birthday. I remember. Changed my world. <laughs> Changed everyone's world. Um, yeah. So, so okay. So you're attributing all, pretty much all your geekiness. You're blaming on your siblings. So that's yes. good. Blame them. I can see that. <laughs> Um, so the, the, what about Young Justice? Did you see Young Justice during the original run or did you see it on Netflix or digital? What did, what's your story there? I did start watching it when it was originally on Cartoon Network. And at this point in time, my daughters were younger and we were watching all of these things together. Um, you know, we had That's watched, awesome. um, the Batman when that was on, um, yep. we watched the Legion of Superheroes, uh, animated yes. series when that was on. So we were, we started watching Young Justice. And that was a challenge at the time because we would watch a few episodes of Young Justice and then oh, wait and then they have a six month hiatus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oi. And I remember like my daughters were sitting there watching this. They were so confused when we hit the end of season one. And then next week we watched the beginning like season of season two. two. <laughs> yeah. Because they were back to back. They delayed the first season yes. so much that the first episode of season two was like a week later. So, I mean, I mean, I'm sorry, a week and five years later, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Wait, so, yeah, I, I was watching it as it was uh, as it was coming out on uh, Cartoon Network, but I did rewatch it once it was on Netflix just because I really loved it and I wanted to get into it. But it was really funny because my first thoughts when we first started watching it was like, of course, we're all going to watch this because it's a DC show. But my initial thought was there's no way this is going to be as good as Justice League Unlimited. Like, yeah, it'll probably be okay, you. but there's no way it's going to be as good as Justice League Unlimited. I, I'm, I'm, I'm pausing because I'm, I, I am, I, I'm feeling you. <laughs> it, at the time, it was hard. It, especially that first season of Justice League Unlimited. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's intense. It's great. It's, um, conscious creation storytelling in that whole season, uh, where they were going with it, which was amazing. And then they had the next season, which had some amazing episodes in it. But definitely there was a step in and they said, look, we don't know who the bad guys are. Is the government the bad guy? That's weird. <laughs> Is the superheroes the bad guys? Those are weird, too. Can we just have a, a big skull base in a swamp somewhere? And uh, um, yeah. so, you know, I'd, I I had seen the trailer my or seen a an ad for it at Comic-Con and then didn't know what it was going to be. And then in November... 
they aired the two episodes and then uh, I saw those and really liked it. But then it was like not until January or February or something that they aired the first, the next season of episodes. It was already a three month hiatus from the first. Yeah. <laughs> it was just like, what is happening right now? And <laughs> um, yeah. And it, it, it being a Titans fan uh, and a Dick Grayson fan, I was in, but I didn't realize how brilliant it was going to be until later on in the season. And then, of course, just how mind blowing it was after a second watching. Oh, yeah. So. And, I, and I've heard you guys talk about this before. And it just what gets me is when you're watching it, you're sitting here thinking, well, this was good, but it'd be great if they brought up this thing, this obscure thing or this very important thing that comes up later in this person's history. But it's it's just an animated series. They're not going to think that far ahead. They're not going to tie something that important in. Yep. And if you give it enough time, they did. And that's what's so amazing about it. <laughs> I know. Exactly. Exactly. And I think we're going to we're gonna talk a little bit about this because you and I were chatting. On, we were chatting on Twitter. And then we started chatting via email. Uh, and I was like, okay, I'm done with this. Save it for the podcast. I want you on the show. <laughs> and you were like, no. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? And he's, you're like, no, I'm, I don't want to, I'm not coming on your show. Uh, and then you gave me this like email that was like four paragraphs describing how you were uh, a little concerned about coming on the show um, because you were a big fan. And I appreciated that. But right in the middle of that tirade about how you shouldn't come on the show <laughs> was a brilliant sentence. And I was like, oh, that's our topic. So apparently I wasn't really paying attention to you. So I owe you an apology oh, no. for, in for entirely ignoring <laughs> your desire to not come on the show and badgering you to come on anyway. <laughs> that's all right. Um, I'm here now. But, what, but what, what you said was, while I firmly believe DC's strength is in mythic storytelling, I also don't believe that that precludes character development on a relatable level and that dichotomy between mythic storytelling and actual character development is fascinating to me. Tell me more about what that is. <laughs> so what I'm looking at when I'm thinking of the mythic st storytelling is that there are all these archetypes bound up into these things and other people you've, yet ha you've had on the show have expounded on this much better than I ever could. But the point is, these are big, broad archetypes of characters doing very specific heroic things that fit certain patterns. And that's all amazing. But at the same time, there's little things that add texture to them that we care about, that make us care about them more while they're still being this big, epic thing. Okay. And yeah. um, I hate to, I always hate to, to do the comparison thing, but as a comparison, because I firmly believe, as, and I love them both, but I firmly believe there is a difference between Marvel storytelling and DC storytelling. Yes. When Tony Stark does something and he screws up, it does not surprise you because that's part of who Tony is. Yes. But you expect Superman or Batman to do the thing that they're doing and be successful. Screwing up isn't part of the archetype, but being human is still part of the archetype or not yes. is still part of the character. Yes. And I don't, you know, I'm not sure how to expound on that better than I have, but there is still, you know, something more to that. Interesting. That's interesting to me. There is a, I think this may be, this may get to some of our conversations about Superman, about this idea that uh, Tony Stark is born to be broken and Superman is born to be perfect, right? Using terrible, mm -hmm. terrible, yeah, gross generalizations. generalizations. Yeah. And then people saying like, well, you can't, you can't tell a good Superman story because of his superpowers. But I've also heard people say you can't tell it because he's perfect. He's just always going to do the right thing. So it doesn't really matter. Right? Right. So I know that DC is technically older and characters, of course, Superman are technically older than Marvel. But you, I think you're hitting on something that I never really thought about before. It's this, this evolution of character. So we, I've said many times, you know, the Batman from 1939 is not the same as the Batman from the 1950s or the 1960s or the 1990s. And they've changed drastically mm -hmm. while still the kind of the heart of the character in many ways is still alive. But when I think about a character like Cyclops, Scott's basically the same. I don't, I can't, unless something's happened in the last 10 years, I'm not aware of. I mean, he, there, there's weird things that get kind of bundled on Scott. Like it, it's become more of a truism that he has terrible at relationships than initially. You well, know, only it's... because it's been the truth for like 40 years. <laughs> but 
I mean, eventually he's like he's like the anti Dick Grayson in that yes. front. <laughs> No one likes him when they're done. It's just it's <laughs> no poor Scott. I love Scott too, and he's no. just handled so badly. <laughs> oh man, I, I hate to go off on a on a weird Scott rant in in a uh, Young Justice podcast, but get that Scott, passion out there, buddy. Scott, Scott was my me. favorite X Men for the longest time. Yeah, I understood that Scott was the one that felt the responsibility and was the one that was the leader and had to be the adult all the time. Right, and it was so weird to me as this kind of shifted into. Scott telling Wolverine, don't go off on a murderous rage because that'll screw up the mission. And that was true at one point in time. And then it kind of morphs through the 90s into, gee, Scott was holding him back. It really just took a murderous rage to solve the situation. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. And, I, you know, I think about this and it's characters who are in leadership roles. Right. So so talk, let, let, let's stay on this because I have some things here. So so Dick Grayson, I think, is a really good example of what you're talking about. This you know the the concept of Batman and Robin. Mm -hmm. It's it's so much so much a part of our like zeitgeist of the of of Earth that people who have never even read a comic know who Batman and Robin are. Yeah. Yet a lot of people don't know who Nightwing is, so they get this idea of Batman and Robin. But Robin as a character, Dick Grayson as a character, has evolved and changed in keeping the through line of who he is, but evolved into a character who is a leader through charisma. Right. He's a leader oh, yeah. because. And this is my opinion. He's a leader because people want, they, they believe in him and they want to do the things because they like Dick, right? Yeah. So, but you look at other like leader characters. So I'm thinking Scott, right? Mm -hmm. Who Who's reflective of the Marvel universe being, well, at least at one point in time, being darker than the DC universe when the DC universe was tended to be more heroic. <laughs> um, a little darker these days, but... Um, where he was the he's very much Dick Grayson, but he's wrong a lot <laughs> yeah. in the Marvel universe. Or another character like say Leonardo to to really jump in a weird direction to the Turtles, right? Mm -hmm. There's always Leonardo and Raphael is the same dynamic as you know as as Scott and Wolverine, and can be seen as a parallel dynamic to Dick and Superboy, mm -hmm. right? Um, or at least Calder and Superboy, as far as Young Justice is concerned. I want to understand that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really interesting because um, even as you're um, talking about that, when you're talking about the failings and a similar archetype and, you know, someone that is kind of comes from a place of failure and getting to success versus somebody that is kind of successful overall but still has the nuance to them. I know we weren't, I mean, you were talking about leaders, but it just immediately struck me when you have the similar archetype of Daredevil and Batman Matt screws up so oh, much. Yeah. You don't always expect Matt to do the right thing. You yeah. don't expect Matt to to finish the mission. You just expect that Matt's going to feel bad if he doesn't finish the mission. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that's that's one thing that drew people to Marvel for a long time is this thing, this feeling of of humanity in a way that, you know, I mess up, therefore my and my heroes mess up, therefore I can relate to them more. Which I think is a, is in a way a what we're talking about here, this this mythology, this this evolution of character through mythology, are in the time when you and I were reading comics, like DC was very shining and bright, and mm -hmm. Marvel got you know was getting gritty and dark and real, quote unquote real. This reflection of them as companies and stories, and the evolution of those stories. You 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 sent me a. a what four page? Yeah, something like dis that. Dis dis dissertation listing a lot of interesting myths, and I'm interested. So you're talking about like traditional examples of, of mythologies, like Lancelot from the Arthurian myths, mm -hmm. um, Robin Hood, um, folklore, right? And how that uh, how that applies to kind of what we're talking about with this comparison of almost between the differences between, even though they're both comic st companies and stories, mm -hmm. Marvel and DC. There's um, I mean. So to, to set this up, I was thinking, you know, framing device, once I started diving into all these uh, folklore and different things like that, I started thinking about people in comics. When you mention the word canon, they literally think this happened five years before this happened. There were exactly this many things that happened at this place. This was this address showed up in this comic. So therefore, it's always that address whenever that that company shows up. And what I'm thinking of when I'm thinking of canon is the broader Definition, a body of principles, rules, standards, or norms. In other words, there's certain things that oh. resonate about a character. It's the canon isn't 
that this thing is has it, to happen yeah. five years after they become this character. It's, it's not that, a it, it's not a data point. Yeah, it's that this thing happens and it changes them and becomes part of them. Dick becoming Nightwing has happened in multiple different media, but there's still the same elements surrounding it. You know, when he becomes Nightwing, you know, even when it happens off, you know, when it happens uh, outside of an episode in uh, Batman, the animated series, or right. when it happens between seasons, it's still Dick kind of becoming his own man and, right. you know, making his own identity while still being the same person that he was originally. Yes. And, th- and that is part of the canon of Dick Grayson is that eventually he will change from Robin to Nightwing and that will be him declaring who he is in his, as an adult. Yes. So, it, and the thing is that, that, that canon wasn't there from the beginning. That is a thing that developed as other people told the story. But once one person said it, it made sense for the character and it just resonated. And from that point on, it keeps happening whenever okay, somebody so retells the story. This is okay. Okay. I'm, my mind is spinning here. <laughs> so there are lots of things that are stated or declared. A lot of data points you're talking about in mm-hmm. comics. Not everything is grabbed onto as canon. Right. Uh, you're blowing my mind a little bit here. Yes, that, <laughs> that resonates with me in the way that Nightwing resonated with me as a character that felt right. So is there, in, in comparing with other comic companies, so again, like the Tony Stark doesn't really, hasn't really changed very much. Like his origin changed, but only because of the data points you know, like it's not really Vietnam anymore. Right. It's more Middle East and that kind of stuff. But Tony, hmm. I think has, part, yeah. this is just this is just my thought. And honestly, I didn't have a lot of this thought until we started hashing this out. But I think what you see with a lot of Marvel characters is DC has retold their setting multiple times. And people joke yes. about that. And sometimes they, you know, say, oh, it's been five years. It's time to reboot things. But the <laughs> yeah. fact of the matter is that has caused a lot of people to analyze what do we put back into this character? What do we keep? What do we not put back in this time? And right. that's been from the beginning. That's not just, we're not just talking about crisis on infinite earths. That was originally everything was one universe, which got declared a separate universe from, you know, the, the, you know, once you have, you know, Barry Allen appear as flash and all of a sudden this is, this is earth one. And that was all earth two. We've retold these stories multiple times. So there's been more time to look and see what is the quintessential essence of the character and how do we want to retell it. Whereas with Marvel, there hasn't been as much that has split off from that that core. Like, yeah, there's been Marvel does micro adjustments where it's like, yeah, Tony did this in Afghanistan, not not in uh, not mm-hmm. in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. But almost everything that's happened to Tony in the comics is assumed to have kind of happened in some form still. We didn't yeah. ever get to the point to where we retold Tony's story. Kind of did with um with the Ultimate Universe, but then they blew that up. So yeah. So let's so um Oh my gosh. So yes, yeah, so like a lot of this starts with Crisis on Infinite Earths, that the story arc from the eighties, the infamous story arc where they take all the multiple Earths from all the companies that DC bought with their different Shazam, Earth S and <laughs> Earth Two and Earth One and and mashed them all together and had to revamp and combine everything. So Huntress was no longer the daughter of Catwoman and Bruce. Huntress became Helena Bertinelli, which is the character that most of us all know now, mm-hmm. decades later. But let, I, I wanted, let's drill it down to another sample character here. Lex Luthor. Yes. Let's talk about, let's talk about Luthor because Luthor's got a long history. It's a character that is, again, almost as like understood or at least known in the zeitgeist as Robin is. Let's talk about him because he has evolved. He's a he's so many different hot takes on oh. Le- Lex Luthor over the years. And, and he's a great example of someone who a new version of him had something new and that carries through to multiple versions later on. Because Lex, when he first appears in Action Comics, and I don't have the dates or anything, but when he first yeah, appears fine. Yeah. way back in the Golden Age, Lex is just a mad scientist. He's a mad yeah, scientist. Yeah, like, like a lab coat wearing mad scientist. Yes, yeah, literally <laughs> the most mad scientist you can make him. And it's just like, I'm going to blow up the city unless you give me this 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 money because I have invented the nuclear bomb. And then the Defense Department told uh, DC Comics, hey, don't run with this right yet. That actually was kind of a neat thing that happened. <laughs> we don't we won't, don't want people doing stories about nuclear weapons yet. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> 
but you I get mean, that yeah. knock on the door. Yeah. So you have Lex just as a mad scientist that, you know, threatens to use his devices to get money. But then in the Bronze Age, they added this nuance that actually became the main thing, which is all of a sudden when you get to power suit wearing Lex, you know, and he's wearing the armor and everything. <laughs> right. To justify <laughs> that Lex has all of this money to come up with these really over the top gadgets to fight Superman with now they start saying that Lex has always owned these shell companies. Like, even when he's in prison or whatever, he owns, like, all of these companies secretly, and it's just funneling money. And all these times that he wanted to demand money, it's because he wanted to prove that he was better than other people, not because he needed the money. Interesting. So, this so it's, it's, it's diving a little deeper into a character. Like, look, if he, if he has all these devices, where's the money coming from? And then answering that question. Right. And then you go full on into the uh, Burns Man of Steel, where... You have Lex that is just full on evil businessman. Like right. they just took the, oh, he owned all these shell companies. How about Lex just openly owns all of this stuff now and Superman can't touch him because he's this evil businessman and he's, you know, playing this chess game and all this stuff is coming up here. This is where we get into, though, something that resonated previously that they tried to get rid of that got put back in because it just made sense because it was part of Lex. And that is evil businessman Lex from Man of Steel was not a super scientist. He was right. just an evil billionaire. Like, I don't know where they got the idea for evil, evil, evil billionaires, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that's not a thing. Um, <laughs> just real quick to clarify, when we talk about Man of Steel, some people may think we're referencing in some way this, the movie that came out. The Man of Steel that you're talking about was a, was a comic that came out, I want to say in the 80s? Yeah, it was, I'm thinking, I don't have Mid-80s. exact dates, but I think it was about a year after Crisis on Infinite Earth wrapped yeah. up. Yeah. I think it was, I think it was like the mid, I want to say it was the mid eighties, mm-hmm. 85, 86. And Man of Steel was basically the, what I consider the, the downshifted, the powered down version of Superman where he's no longer like in the super friends, just moving the earth, uh, as he's flying around or, <laughs> the solution you know, is just to move the moon, everyone. <laughs> let's move the moon out of the way. That won't cause any problems. You know, that kind of thing. The 1977, you know, Superman movie um style you know where he can change time and those kinds of things were things that he could do i mean he had so many superpowers in the 40s and 50s and yeah. he had super sewing at one point and made a wedding dress <laughs> like it was bonkers so the this became the more kind of grounded version where he he could be hurt a little bit more or he wasn't he he was he was the strongest being on the planet but he wasn't moving the planet yeah. Right. Um, and so it could it could give you a different perspective on him. And there were several characters that that got a bit of a revamping. And that's the Man of Steel miniseries you're talking about where Business right. Lex came in. Gotcha. And, All right. So so when did this mad scientist Lex make a reappearance? Um, it's, I'm trying to think. I mean, I know by the time or why is a better question. Like, why did he become why did he make a reappearance? I think I um fairly certain by the time you see by the time you get to the death of superman in the 90s you're back to lex having at least a basis in science and having a little bit of a hand in the things that he's he's doing here and um so i think i think after a while just being the evil businessman does not feel as um as substantial and i can't remember who it was there was one um i think it was neil gaiman that said just having Lex as only evil businessman kind of feels like just having a skinny kingpin. It was. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that coming, but yes, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. There needed to be something a little bit more to Lex. And since he had decades of being the mad scientist, is it really that big of a deal to have evil business Lex also be a mad scientist? Right. So have him just be a genius. Right. Across the board. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not sure, I, I'm trying to remember if the Underworld Unleashed did, um, I think, when he made his deal with Neron and sold his soul. Okay, yeah, I'm flashing <laughs> back. I'm sorry, I'm dusting off that file. Yeah, I know. I gotcha. But I, I'm thinking part of that deal was that he wanted to be, like, super intelligent as well as just, you know, super good at business. And that was that was how they retconned it into the 90s, where all of a oh sudden it was like, he's a super scientist now, too. <laughs> oh my gosh, I have to dig out all my... <laughs> It's, it's weird because there was so much stuff going on and that was a, that was a uh, <laughs> that arc was entertaining we'll say <laughs> it had some interesting takes on a few things um i think i made reference to it in the show i think that's where where blue devil's powered suit stops being a powered suit 
something happens and it becomes incorporated into him in some way. Yeah. I, anyway, all right, we're, we're the, the, getting off on a tangent. Yeah, I know. But, the main thing I remember about that was just that, you know, Billy Batson was so good that he couldn't sell his soul because he was too good for that. And that ruined all of Neron's plans. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Go Billy. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, I mean, regardless of how it happened though, eventually the need was there to say, he can't just be evil businessman. Evil businessman feels right, but mad scientist also feels right. So let's, add that back into Lex. So that's one of those things that over all of these retellings, things just start populating onto Lex. And whenever you do this stuff, when it makes sense, it becomes part of the character from then on, whenever you you, um, reintroduce the character. And then the latest thing, which dovetails with something that happened in Young Justice, is politician Lex. Yes. Because you have in our worlds at war and that era of Superman, Lex becomes the president. Yeah. And that, again, for some reason, evil billionaire becoming president resonated with people. (laughs) And because that resonated with people, that has kind of wheedled its way into Lex from that point on, where that part of his story keeps coming up, where somehow Lex gets into politics, he gets some kind of official standing with the government. And we see that now in Young Justice with him being the um, the UN chairman. UN chairman. And in Justice League Unlimited, though he didn't become president, he there was the parallel universe, you know, uh, world where he did become president and mm-hmm. that that universe's Superman killed him. Right. Uh, and then things went left real quick. <laughs> went dark <laughs> real quick. Um so this which is, is a, a yeah, fantastic so this- series. Yeah, politics, polit- politician Lex is another thing that seems to make sense for the character. So even though you have this archetype, there is this organic growth of who the character is that starts making them unique. Right. And so, so how, so let's talk about the myth of this though, right? So, you know, I, I, I often say things like if you keep the heart of the character there, then if you keep the heart of the character, then you can do lots of changes around the heart of that character, right? Mm-hmm. Take Bruce Wayne and put him in the Wild West right? Take Yusagi Yojimbo and put him in space, right? You can do all of these things and you keep the heart of the character. You can change a lot of things around him, but you're, you're talking about almost the slow periodic evolution of the heart of the character. Yeah. Like there, it's almost little like things they pick up from every one of those drifts that comes yeah. back to the core. Yeah. I, I, I say, um, you know, uh, uh, again, a little nod to Marvel I say the best for me, this is just for me, the best live action Lex Luthor that I have ever seen, or the best Lex Luthor I have seen outside of Young Justice's Lex Luthor is season three of Daredevil's Kingpin. <laughs> because that's the way I personally see Lex. Like he's, you, you think you're a few days ahead of K- Kingpin in there and you realize he's actually three years ahead of you. Right. Like mm-hmm. you, that's as it, as onion layers get peeled back, you realize what he's been setting up the whole time. And that's the Lex that I see in Young Justice is maybe not so much that he's planned three years ahead, but I think that's part of it. But also this thing that I'm sorry, I cannot remember who said this to me the first time. I think it was Darcy Ross, but I'm not sure where she said Lex is so evil. He just gives people what they want. <laughs> And I mean, and then when you catch him in a lie, he doesn't argue with you. This is the, this is the art of uh, uh, what I call Aikidoing or judoing conversation. If you don't give someone something to grab onto, it becomes difficult for them to argue with you. And Lex does that in this brilliant way, right? Like Superboy calls him out. You lied to me, right? Oh, yeah. You gave me these shields and you told me you didn't know who this was, but you did know who this was. And Lex is like, you're right. <laughs> also, this needed to get done. When when you say you're, uh, you're right, then Superboy's deflated because there's nothing to get angry at because he's like, wait, oh, okay, yeah, okay, he's agreeing with me. Oh, yeah. Um, I had just rewatched uh, season two again before uh, season three came out, and the whole episode with Arsenal, when he gives yes. him the arm. Yes. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> that whole thing is just brutal. It's brutally good. Mm-hmm. Right, you're just watching this, and you're horrified. And or or targets where Red Arrow is. Everyone knows he knows Lex is a villain. They know Lex is a villain. Can't prove a thing. Yeah, right. There's nothing to prove. 
right? And mm-hmm. and Lex saying like, look, I'm not saying I'm I agree with you. I'm not on the side of the angels. This time I happen to be doing something for the angels. Are you going to stop me from doing that? Like it's just so gets under your skin in this great way. Like so this character has evolved into this thing that we see him as now. But there's some other interesting there's some other interesting analogies that you bring up here or characters. So Harley Quinn, Ace the Bat Hound. Like these are I mean, Harley's a big one because she first appeared, she was just a like a, a one of Joker's malls, like yeah, in Batman the been, animated series. That could have just been a visually interesting hench person in an episode. And, and that's uh, not what happened. <laughs> no, and she continues to evolve over yeah. time um, as well. And- yeah, and it, one of the things, one of the big things that has happened is that as they've moved, for example, you know, Harley and Poison Ivy, they've moved that whole relationship, which was subtext in Batman the Animated Series, to being a literal part of her character now yeah. in most incarnations. Yes. So, okay, so let's, it, it, so I have to, I'm going to ask this question. This feels to me, this ability to slowly – because this, this changes you're talking about in Lex Luthor are 40-plus years oh, yeah. of changes. So is the fact that this – the way that comics work, this unique aspect of, of comics media existing over such a long period of time and characters existing over an, an absurdly long period of time, is it unique to these – to this particular media, this ability to evolve – or are you kind of thinking this echoes to the overall, the bigger picture of quote unquote mythology in which maybe like characters like Robin Hood have evolved over time, that kind of thing? Like, is, is it about time? Yeah, I think it's time. And I think it's also um, one unique thing I think that is more true of DC than Marvel right now, which will not necessarily be true going into the future, is DC has been in comics, but there were movie serials back in, you know, oh, yeah, in the sure. early days. Uh, DC had TV series first. So you have different people telling the story in different mediums, which is something that you also have with, for example, King Arthur or with Robin Hood, where you had people originally telling these as oral folk tales. You had people writing novels about these things. You had people turning these into plays and musicals and then eventually into movies. So you have multiple different versions told in multiple different ways. And you have the opportunity for more and more things to resonate and someone to say, I need this version to have this thing that came from this version that wasn't originally in the story. Um, one of the things I didn't realize for the longest time was that Lancelot is not like a core principle in a lot of the early Arthurian stories. This is so funny. I literally was having this conversation not two <laughs> hours ago. Uh, a, a friend of mine, a fr- my best friend from childhood is, is visiting us and his mom called and his mom is taking a class on mythology and psychology or something Mm -hmm. and and she was talking about you know when you say something is myth do you mean that it's real that it's that it's not real or that it's based on a person that exists or what does this word myth necessarily mean and she brought up arthur and i was like well the arthur myths are basically the same as the justice league right wonder woman and superman and batman were created in a vacuum for their own universes and then brought together for the justice league and that's what happened with the arthurian myths in um, the Once and Future King and Le Mort d'Arthur, right? So like that that kind of combination. And, and Lancelot was not part of that for so long. Yeah. And, and what's, what's even more interesting when you, when you compare this to DC Comics and you look at someone like Captain Marvel that started off with a different company or with the, right. the Carlton characters. Yes. yes. Lancelot was actually a separate story. It wasn't just that he was added to the Arthurian story. There was this whole other yeah, epic he had his poem own about Lancelot and then eventually somebody said, you know what? We should put him into our, our uh, shared Arthurian universe. No one said that. But it actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> right. And the, then even then, um, Lancelot evolves because it turned originally Lancelot stories are just that, well, he's in love with Guinevere, but he is the perfect knight, so he would never do anything about it. Then it right. turns into, no, this is what kind of causes the entire fall. Right. So even that evolves over time. This is this. That's the interesting point. That's the interesting bit. He's not. It, it's like uh, uh, Jeff Stormer said that this, the good Superman stories aren't about whether he succeeds. The good Superman stories are whether or not his morality comes out intact at the other side. And that's the interesting part about the Lancelot Guinevere Arthur triangle is the mm-hmm. fact that Lancelot 
morality does not survive. Yeah, ex- exactly. And that is something that developed over time because the earliest, even the earliest incorporations into the Arthurian legends were that here is the perfect knight. This is the one that no one else can live up to. And then it turned into here is the perfect knight uh, until this point. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, but uh, all I have going through my head right now is Lancelot's Simwa from Camelot right now. <laughs> if you've ever heard that song. Say uh, moi, uh, say moi, tis I. <laughs> I've never lost in battle or game. I'm simply the best by far. <laughs> it's just so good, guys. If you haven't seen K, it's a freaking classic. I love it. Oh, but I mean, and then, you know, when you talk about the Robin Hood, there's so many things that, like, I remember when I went to go see the Kevin Costner Robin Hood, which is like the only thing that most people have gotten to see. There were so many people that were like, they didn't do the archery contest. Yeah. I am almost certain that original versions of the story did not contain not that. This was ar- something yeah, did not that, have the archery contest. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. This is something that evolved over time. And I, you know, Robin hood appears in as a, as a supporting character in Ivanhoe who he's just basically, you know, this grumpy guy that's you know upset <laughs> about, you know, yeah. it's not, it's not like this deeper. He's a, he's a dude. Ivanhoe met that one time. Yeah. <laughs> But but even then, it's shaded a lot more with the whole conflict between the Normans and the Saxons, which yeah. is not a thing that his story on its own ever even usually deals with. You're right. And to me, I look at it, it's like, oh, he's the Boba Fett of Ivanhoe, <laughs> where everybody was like, that guy's cool. I want more stories about that guy. <laughs> it's no good to me dead. He's no good <laughs> to me dead. <laughs> Prince John says. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, so, so let's talk about that. So, so echoing back to, um, uh, our discussion with MC Gould about mythology and her talking about like Jason and the Argonauts, right? Where it was all these demigods mm-hmm. that were brought together and put on this boat to go do this thing. I was just like, blew my mind. Right. But this is kind of what we're talking about with the Arthurian myths as well. It was this collection of characters from other stories and other lands mm-hmm. brought together to do this. And, this idea that that in bringing them together, they become they stop being in a vacuum in the story. Therefore, can evolve. Like you don't know what Arthur. I, I think you find out more about who Arthur is and what Arthur is in reflection of the loss of Guinevere and Lancelot and that friendship and dynamic and that betrayal than right. you do than you do if you had not had them in there, right? Or Guinevere or Gwen or or, or you know. Uh, all, all of the characters that are from all over the world that come into that. The thing that's always gotten me about, um, and this is, this is also going to be a thing that ties back to something that I actually kind of believe about DC Comics, but um, the whole arc of Arthur's story is basically that things were bad, things get good, things get idyllic, things get bad, things fall apart, and it's a cycle. Yeah. That is the entire story. The more texture you add to the fact that these seeds were planted by the little mistakes that people made along the way, the more interesting the story becomes. Yes. One thing that I'm starting to notice, as much as I used to, you know, I used to be one of these people that would joke about, oh, they're restarting DC again, but DC's story arcs are sometimes stronger when you see the arc, when you see the thing progress. One of the things about the DC animated universe, you know, looking back at Batman the Animated Series, Superman the Animated Series, Justice League Unlimited, and all that. Yeah. There was actually a certain arc to Batman to where he is a street level vigilante. He then knows that there are, uh, there's this wider world of people and he starts interacting with people like Etrigan and Zatanna and, right. And then he gets away from being just focused on getting vengeance on criminals in Gotham. Like he's reluctant at first, but eventually he becomes an integral part of the justice league. He moves beyond that. And you also get the feeling that maybe Gotham isn't as terrible when he's not there because he has made a difference, which is something that interesting. Some, sometimes when people don't let him make a difference in Gotham, it makes his character look different than I view his character. Like, yeah. If he never makes a difference in Gotham, then why is he doing it? Yeah. And you know what? This, this whole thing that you're talking about Batman, and we've just in, in reflection of Luther and his evolution, the mythology evolving, right? Mm-hmm. It's, more than, it's more than just the... Hello, citizen. 1966 Batman, right, evolving mm-hmm. into you know the the Dark Knight Returns Batman, but but there are things that have been carried through, right? And one of those things, which is so interesting to me, is this: what is Batman's role in the Justice League? Oh yeah, 
And, you know, lots of people have been like, okay, well, Green Arrow and Batman, what are they even doing with Wonder Woman and Superman and, uh, you know, these characters? But in the 90s, around the 90s, he started taking on this tactician role. And I don't know if that was a reflection of a char- the character that they were showing in Batman the Animated Series in the early 90s um, and who that person was supposed to be. But in the comics, he started becoming this character that we see so prominently with Bruce Greenwood's Batman and Young Justice, mm-hmm. which is he is the coordinator. He is the man with the plan. You, he's 10 steps ahead. He's got a contingency plan for taking down every league member in case somebody goes rogue. Like he, he's this guy, but he's not always been that guy. No, no. I mean, there's several like old, like silver age stories where the joke was basically, ha ha, I stole all your powers. I don't have powers. Bink. I win. Yes. You know, it's, <laughs> it's not really a strategy. It's just a well-used trope <laughs> default. <laughs> yeah. And they actually, it's funny cause they actually echoed that in, uh, in young justice as well. When they put, uh, when Tigris puts that clamp around, uh, Dick. And he's like, no powers to take away. (laughs) I can see this now, and I think people can recognize this now as as a cornerstone aspect of Batman that we don't want to go away. That makes sense to him. Yeah, exactly. That character. The tactician aspect has the tactician aspect has kind of felt right. It fits in the shape of Batman. So it's right. something that sticks with them. The other thing about that, and I know this isn't necessarily true of anybody anyone, but it's maybe true of people like us that like Dick Grayson. I think the tactician aspect is also a way to see the difference between Batman's leadership style and Dick's leadership style. Batman's yeah. kind of cold. He's very technical. You're going to do this. You guys need to do this. Execute the plan now. Whereas Dick is a lot more adaptable and he's more, he's more, he's less drilling people to do specific things and more understanding their capabilities. Yeah. And I think I'm feeling like we see this in Young Justice, particularly in the beginning, these first 13 episodes of season three. Like I was rewatching the first three episodes because, you know, we're doing our deep dives and it's just stuff like he's just ready to go on the fly, like Artemis reroute to Black Lightning's position. I'm going in. We've lost communication with Super. He's just on it, you know, but he still seems to be acting. He, but he doesn't feel like Batman. No, um, I think and I actually think this is something that I don't know if it's unintentional. It's an unintentional development, but Batman does seem like the type of leader you would have when all the people that you're leading are people that you trained. Yes. You know, it's, he's not bringing in people that he hasn't worked with before. These are all people like even Barbara is someone that he taught her a lot of what she knows. Yeah. And it's all his playbook. It's not bringing together people and learning about them. It's, I told them how to do these things. Yeah. Okay. So I want to switch gears. I think we've we've established a a great foundation of this conversation. I think this conversation could go on for hours, (laughs) but one of the, one of the things that I want to, I want to shift gears to kind of uh, for, as as we start wrapping up is talking about uh, another character that you and I were talking about earlier that I don't know that much about, which is Cassandra Savage, right? So this newer character that already has apparently a lot of folklore around her that I don't know. And we're now getting introduced, I'm getting introduced to in in Young Justice with that mind-blowing episode seven of season three. Can you talk just a little bit about her and like the history of her and how this, uh, wh- why, why, bring, why bring her into this conversation? I am really fascinated to see what they do with Cassandra because the idea of Vandal Savage and having his daughter becoming an important character, it's really not that old. I mean, it, um, Scandal Savage, who is the character that I'm, Thinking that, you know, maybe the prototype for this, okay, essentially, came about during uh, Infinite Crisis, which was, that was, what, 2005? Two th- six, yeah, about 2005. Like that. So yeah. she is not a character that's been around for a long time. But she was basically a character that was trained by her father to be basically his heir to a certain extent, and rebelled against her father, and ends up leading this team of villains called the Secret Six, which are like this band of misfits that kind of thwart the plans of the secret society of supervillains. Okay. And what's interesting about that is um, later on, even though she's a young character, she showed up in the comics, but there's been, um, they used a version which they called Cassandra Savage in the Arrowverse when they go to the future and 
she is like one of you know she is a true believer in uh, vandal savage's forces in there oh because savage is a big part of legends of tomorrow yes I somehow and, totally and, forgot about that and she turns against her father's teachings in legends of tomorrow and starts fighting out fighting against him there they did a direct to video um movie called hell to pay for suicide squad where uh-huh. she shows up she and, wait she's in that yeah i've seen hell to pay yeah it's really good it's mm-hmm. not it's not family friendly no it's not um, so just be aware <laughs> of that for our listeners yes. but i do remember it being really quite good but i don't remember her in this yeah um scandal that was his his daughter that um that was working for him it, and then man. um when knockout anyway i don't want to ruin it for anybody that might might watch it okay but okay fair Okay, that is fair. another I'll, another I'll version of her that's already appeared in another media. So once again, what we're talking about here is you have a television series, you have a direct-to-video movie, you have the comic book series. These are all different versions of, of Vandal Savage's daughter that are already starting to develop a prototype of a thing that is true when you introduce Vandal Savage's daughter, which is she was trained by him, she was loyal, then she turns against him. Interesting. And so you're thinking that you're thinking that, that might feed into it's almost like we're watching a, a, the the thing that we're talking about with Lex and everything else happening right now with a character that we have just enough time, like we're talking about, so just enough time with the character now that we're already starting to see people testing out what is real for this character. Yes. And something that really struck me that made me think, and again, this is the whole Young Justice, there are no coincidences thing. <laughs> This version of Vandal is much more closely tied to Apocalypse. Yes. Scandal Savage, which may not be the same as Cassandra, but it may be. Um, Scandal, her one true love, is one of the, the female Furies, um, Knockout. You have a chance there to tie in Apocalypse and her coming into <sighs> contact with one of the female Furies and developing this relationship. See... And I- I hate you now because I, I have to have that. That's got to be a thing now. This is what I'm wondering. It may not happen, but I'm wondering about that because... You can't have grainy goodness and not have the Fury show up at exactly. some point. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's just... Yeah, you got to have... They're going to have to show up. Some version of the Furies. The other oh, thing that, that was really interesting is um, if you've never read Secret Six, when they first get together, they have a parademon who they only ever call parademon. Yeah, right. And parademon feels very much like a nihilistic version of Forager. <laughs> yes, I know that character, and I agree with you 100%. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh, fascinating. Okay. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> All right, you've given me so much to think about already just on <laughs> Cassandra Savage, but also on this, the beauty of, and, and, uh, and I was going to say uniqueness of comics, but I guess in comparison with long-term mythology like Arthurian legends and so on and so forth, we also see this effect happening. Um, uh, my brain is, 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 is <laughs> rolling up right now. Okay, so I'm going to be keeping my eye on Cassandra Savage and the other places that she shows up, and I am going to be fascinated in 10 years to look back and see who the character is, like which things end up sticking that yeah. work that makes sense for the character. I'm fascinated. The other thing that I'm kind of curious about, and again, this is just spitballing, but again, it's Young Justice, so anything is possible. Hey, put the tin hat on. We're doing it all the time. One of the original people that is in her secret six, that's in her, you know, her basically her group of misfit uh, villains is Cheshire. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so you're killing me. You're killing yeah, me. Yeah, I'm. I'm just saying okay. this could be really <laughs> fascinating. Just saying, just saying, it's there. There it is. There it is. Oh my gosh. There, right, there are this no was, accidents in Young Justice. <laughs> there are no, there's zero <laughs> accidents in Young Justice. Oh my gosh. Okay. I, this is definitely going to be one that I'm going to have to re listen to over and over again <laughs> as well. Jared, thank you so much for spending time with us in the Watchtower. Where can people find you out on Earth Prime if they want to beat you with a stick for a year? <laughs> well, you can find me. My articles are on Gnome Stew. And you can also find me at my What Do I Know blog, where I do some of my own uh, reviews and things like that. And that's at nighterrantjr.blogspot.com. 
And if you want to find me on Twitter, I am at night errant underscore JR. Perfect. We'll have links to all that stuff in the, in the show notes as well. So thanks to everyone else for spending some time with us as well. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com, on our website crashingthemode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating or review, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us do more in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And as always, stay warmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.